Award-winning documentarian Ken Burns talks with HEC about the filmmaking process, the introduction of his own editing tool on Mac computers, and the value of teamwork. I wanted to be a filmmaker from age 12. I watched my dad cry at an old movie and I had never seen him cry before and I realized how powerful therefore film could be. And so I wanted to be a filmmaker, but that man a feature filmmaker. But I ended up going to Hampshire College in Amherst, Massachusetts, and all of my teachers were documentary filmmakers. And so I kind of quickly uh, rearranged and ended up being a documentary filmmaker. I'm interested in telling stories. I'm, I'm first and foremost, I mean, a lot of people call me a historian and I guess I am an amateur historian, but I'm really a storyteller, a filmmaker. And fortunately, history is mostly made up of the word story plus high, which is a good way to begin a story. And so I'm just drawn to stories in American history and all of the films we've made to date have been in American history. And sometimes the idea will take several decades to incubate. Sometimes you'll want to do it right away, but other things are happening and, and it gets put off. Other things you just drop everything and start doing. I've been trying to will old photographs to come alive, to treat them as if they were not two-dimensional static objects, but living, breathing, dimensional things that had a past and had a future from that moment. And so I've employed a lot of techniques, not only visually, but also orally to do that. And my friend Steve Jobs, uh, he became my friend, uh, had decided to try to experiment with panning and zooming on uh, photographs. And so it's a very superficial way, but it's been an amazing tool in iPhoto and iMovie. And it's been since January of 2003 on every single Mac computer and permits people to transform birthday parties and vacations and bar mitzvahs into a story using kind of rudimentary aspects of the technique. But I'm trying to treat each photograph the way that feature filmmaker that I originally wanted to be would have done with the master shot, a long shot, a medium shot, a close shot, a tilt, a pan, a reveal, and isolated details of the frame, and then add to it. I don't just look at the photograph, I listen to it. You know, are the cannon firing? Are the troops tramping? Is the horse winning? Is the bat cracking? So all of these things are an attempt to, to will an old photograph alive. There are four oral and four visual tricks or things that we employ. Obviously, on the visual side, we have still photographs, we have newsreel when we have it, we have live cinematography, and we have interviews. The sound side, the oral side, has a third-person narrator, which is not uncommon, but we also have employed for decades a chorus of first-person voices that read letters and journals and diaries, to which we add to the third person narrator and supplement with authentic music from the period and then also a very complicated sound effects track sometimes hundreds of tracks that we're mixing down to make that old photograph or that painting come alive we have a funny saying in the editing room which is that this two-dimensional stuff the paintings and the drawings and the photographs we treat as live and we treat the live as if they're paintings so we might go to an al quiet battle site at Gettysburg and try to take a frame that looks gorgeous and try to exclude all the modern things that are there and then take a shot that's painterly and at the same time we're trying to find the paintings and make them come alive with all of those effects and techniques that we've been talking about. The story of the buffalo seems at once sort of specific and singular and yet it touches every aspect of our very complicated past, particularly our past that deals with Native people's manifest destiny and Western expansion. And so the story of the buffalo is a kind of tragedy and then a parable of de-extinction and a complicated ongoing story. Too often we've seen ourselves as the dominant species on earth, but unrelated or unconnected and unobligated to everything else around us. And the important thing to understand is that quite often our point of view, our perspective is not necessarily the only one. It never is the only one. Sometimes you have to just stop and listen to other people. So this film is populated with Native Americans, with indigenous people, with scholars and biologists, and they can remind you that there's a whole 
new way of seeing things. I'd rather be reaching people that don't necessarily know the story of the buffalo or aren't necessarily caught up in conservation efforts because maybe however significant or at however marginal that change might be you have the possibility to speak to as many people as possible that's that's what i want to do and that's what a good story does so this is so much more than the story of the american buffalo and it is of course specifically about the american buffalo I've been working with my cinematographer, who was my assistant in the early 70s. So it's been 50 years working with Buddy Squires. It's been more than 40 years working with Jeffrey C. Ward, Dayton Duncan. It's been 30, Lynn. It's been more than 30. And I've tended to use people again and again. I do like that continuity and I do like the intimacy of that working group. But for as many as uh, people that we rightfully thank in our credits, hundreds, um, these are all handmade films. So even something as big as the Vietnam series, 10 episodes, 18 hours, it's really made by 15, 16, 17 people, most of all handmade in that way. And so we don't have legions of researchers. It's just a handful of us looking and trying to find the information or the, or the visual material. At the same time, we're constantly bringing up new folks. And so we're constantly refreshed. And many of the people that we've now been working for a long time started off as interns, worked their way up the ranks. But I'm really thrilled that people stick around.